what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders you've heard of, some you've never heard of, the founder of P90X, Tony Horton. He talked about, you know, Chris, what I love talking about is the big challenges, you know, because we're all fighting through different challenges from even early age. He made money as a street mime. That's how he made money, uh, food and rent money. He put his hat on the street and he would do street mining. That's how he made money early on before he sold hundreds of millions of dollars with P90X. Baby Einstein founder Julie Clark talked about growing her company to 20 million with five people early on then selling to Disney. But more impressively, she beat cancer twice. Uh, Atari founder Nolan Bushnell talked about how when he was Steve Jobs' mentor, Steve offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. There's many more. Check out inspiredinsider.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Um, at Rise25, we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners. And we do that because we help you run your podcast so it generates ROI. I know Chris is a big advocate of podcasting. He's a great podcast. You can check it out. I've listened to many episodes. Um, but for me, Chris, podcasting is much more personal. It's not just about business. It was inspired by my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor. And him and his brother were concentration camps in Nazi Germany, and they're the only members of their families to survive. And his words and legacy live on. And crazy stories. If you go to my About page on Inspired Insider, I actually... Um, have a video. Um, there's a short video and then there's a long video down. You can listen to his whole story, you know, really crazy stuff he had to endure. Um, but the Holocaust Foundation did an interview with him and, you know, his legacy lives on because of that interview. And so I feel like the work I'm doing with the podcast, Chris, the work you're doing with your podcast um, and, you know, the, the companies that we help launch a podcast are really leaving a legacy of knowledge and for themselves. So I personally credit podcasting the best thing I've done for my business and my life and my relationships. We take off 99% of the work so your business can actually focus on the best use of your time, which is relationships and connecting to those relationships. So, um, you know, we have clients that range from a Berkshire Hathaway company to lawyers, consultants, SaaS companies, you name it. Um, and our team has been working with podcasters, you know, since 2009. So I think if you have a business, whether you use this or not, you should have a podcast, period. Um, if you have questions, support at rise25media.com or go to rise25.com. Check out more. Um, thank you. I'm excited to, to introduce today's guest. We have Chris Martinez, founder of Dude, and you can find them at dudeagency.io. They help digital agencies take on more clients and scale up with their flat rate unlimited web design and development using their team in Tijuana, Mexico. And they're obsessed with hitting deadlines and helping agencies grow. They give you all the benefits. I love this part, Chris. You know, they give you all the benefits of outsourcing without the downsides. And we know, you know, st you know staying up till one, not hearing back, all those communication issues, you're, you help solve those for companies, uh, for agencies. And they work with all types of platforms, WordPress, Shopify, ClickFunnels, Leadpages, Aweber, Webflow, many more. It just depends on your needs. You know, Chris, thanks for joining me. Ah, thank you so much for that introduction. And yeah. I think I'm pretty sure this is the uh, first time I've ever been interviewed by a doctor. So really, <laughs> thank okay. you so much. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Um, it's an honor. So, yeah, <laughs> it's an honor for me too. You know, I've done a lot of research ahead of time and I want to dig into, you know, I talk about the challenges and we'll talk about some of those because you look at someone, you just see, oh, it, there was just always an upward trajectory and there's times in your life that have been difficult from tough upbringing to your, I want to hear about the lessons from your dad and all yeah. of that. Um, but I want to start with, um, you know, really there was a point in your, in your career that you had $20 in the bank. Okay. And, and less again, than like, and, and <laughs> less than that. that, yes, less than that. But there was a specific point. Like a, I think there was, I don't know, it was a breaking point or like a, a turning point where you had $20 in the bank. Yep. Um, and just talk about that for a little bit and then, you know, we'll, we'll dive into what you do as well. Yeah. Well, I've actually been broke uh, a couple times. So the first time, you know, my dad died of cancer. He had pancreatic cancer. He was diagnosed in his 
dead in a month. Sorry, I died three that. days before yeah. my twenty seventh birthday. Um, and you know, for me, um, and maybe we can talk about the childhood stuff, you know, in a second. But for me, I, I never really had that traditional father son relationship, at least that I saw on TV. You know, so it, it, when I was when he got sick, it was right around the time when I was started when we started to connect um on a deeper level you know like he was seeing me as a man and he started to comment on my, you know the work that i was doing and i started to feel that admiration and i could relate to the things that he had done throughout his working career and then you know within a month it's gone wow you know, it was just it happened taken. that quickly yeah he was diagnosed on i read it i think it was Jeez. december 9th and he died on january 10th um and so you know that just rocked me uh and it's shocking being, being a guy, and I'm speaking to all the other guys out there who were always taught, you know, guy, boys don't cry and just suck it up, you know, like that was the mentality that I had. And I mm. took all these emotions and I just shoved them down. And what happens, um, maybe not for everybody, but it happened for me is that that stuff is not, you know, it's still there and it bubbles up to the surface. Mm. And oftentimes it would come out in ways that I didn't like. And so, um, you know, after my dad died, I decided, you know what, I'm going to start this soccer magazine. I've always been a soccer player. I love the game. Um, and so I said, you know, I'm going to start this print magazine at like the worst time in history. I didn't know anything about running a business. And so I started this, this magazine and I, it just completely flopped, you know, if, if, if I failed miserably and all due to me, you know, like looking back at all the stupid mistakes that I made, I was like, well, no, no wonder why it failed. What would you do differently now? Oh man. Um, well, one, I needed more capital. Yeah. Um, what were the mistakes two, you made? I, I shouldn't have done a magazine, right? It was right. 2007 is right at that period where things are starting to move to mm. digital. So it was a print magazine. It was a print local magazine, regional magazine. Mm. So um, I would have done a blog, you know, I would have invested in learning more about digital marketing and um, creating content and, you know, like sourcing other writers. Cause one of the other big thing is I try to do everything myself. And, and so, you know, there's all these little mistakes, not understanding the actual business side of it, thinking that, you know, if I build it, then people will like it, not really listening to what the market wanted, all these mistakes that I made. And so, you know, within 18 months I'd lost everything and emotionally like i was just in a very very bad place you know like my my response to emotional and physical pain is anger right mm -hmm. and i i like i've always been kind of like a fighter like a brawler <laughs> so um i would lash out at everybody and i hurt everybody and um you know alienated myself from everybody i was not a pleasure to be around during that time period so I don't blame anybody for like creating distance because I was a nightmare. But, um, you know, from a financial standpoint, I, I had to get a job. Right. And so I had two interviews. I, I had always done sales. So I knew that I could get another sales job. So I got a sales job basically working for this charter bus company that was based in Seattle. And they gave me a decent salary plus commission. So I was like, okay, you know, like this is going to be good. I'm going to be able to turn this around. So the first week, that they trained me, I went up to Seattle and they put me up in a hotel and they paid for all my meals. And, you know, so they took care of me. So I didn't have to worry about money. But then, you know, come that Friday, I was scheduled to fly home back to LA. And I'm like freaking out in the morning. Of course, nobody knew, but I'm freaking out because I had no idea how I was going to get home from the airport because I didn't have any money. You know, the airport ride from LAX to Hermosa Beach, where I was living, was about 36 bucks. And I didn't have $36 and this is before Uber, you know, like, so I didn't know how I was going to make it back. So fortunately that morning, somehow I fell into a pay period and they gave me a check for like 300 or 350 bucks. And I was like, Oh my God, this is the most amazing paycheck that I've ever had. Because yeah. if you've ever been that broke and then by some miraculous, you know, whatever you wind up getting some extra money, it is like, like a it was like a million dollars. It was like, yeah, it, it gives you the breathing room to know that you can survive. And I had figured out how to survive, you know, like 99 cent store spaghetti. Um, yeah, you know, I talk lived about off of what that. your life looked like then on just surviving, you know? 
Um, it, it's, it's hard to describe it because um, at, my mental state at the time was that I really enjoy, I, like, it's hard to say it and, and make it sound like may, maybe like people won't relate to it or it doesn't sound right. But I embraced that pain. I needed that pain because that was the connection that I had to my dad. Mm. See, now you're going to make me cry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, you felt that connection to your dad because of that. That's all I had left. That's all I had left at the time. You know, um, the life insurance money that he had left me gone. And actually I was, uh, relieved when it was gone because I felt like that was blood money. Mm. I had a lot of, I had a lot of yeah. guilt around it. Yeah. And so, um, you know, like I would go to the cemetery like every single week and just sit at mm. his, at his side. Yeah. And so like the pain and the anguish was my connection to that experience. Cause I wasn't ready to, to move on. Uh, I appreciate your perspective on this, Chris, because, you know, some people may be listening, they've lost someone. Some people may be listening, they haven't, and it hopefully pr provide some perspective because I've heard you say this in other content that like you would pay every cent you have to, you know, which I thought was pretty, uh, I was still surprised by the statement, right? You're like, I would give all the money, everything I have right now, just to say, I love you to him. I'm like, holy cow, like that's, that's a serious statement, right? Um, and so not just for people who lost people, but people who you have them, um, you know, it's like life is short. Like that was, that was like a month period that transpired that like it's a blink of an eye, you know, everything changes. So you just never know, you know? Yeah, and I mean like, you know, him being sick, there was just so much uh, uncertainty as to, we didn't know what was going on. You know, like one doctor said that he had three months, Another doctor said he's got some, you know, years. Um, the oncologist that was yeah. supposed to treat him in the hospital said that he had three months and he died yeah. a week later. Yeah. And so, like, I just didn't know what was going on. And I mean, I think, you know, and I want to talk about the lessons you learned from him, but I think in my mind, your passion about your business, just from an outside perspective and what you do is because really with what you do with um, Dude, is you give people time back. You give people time back to do what they want to do, right? Whether it's working harder on the business or yep. whether it's, I know you've had people call you and they're on the beach somewhere and they could do that because they have your team working in the background to fulfill on stuff that they would have to be staying up till two in the morning doing. Yeah. And there, you know, there's another side of it too that I really, really enjoy and it's creating opportunities, right? Because nobody ever thinks that anything positive comes out of Mexico, let alone Tijuana, Mexico. Like you see it on the news and it's all bad. Mm. And um, got a, you know, got a I was blessed. Rap. I was blessed by being able to find this little niche and being able to coach all these uh, team members that we have here. And uh, you know, we're giving them an opportunity that they wouldn't necessarily had or have had they not have, have found us. And mm. so it's really, really enjoyable to see them not only make more money, uh, but learn new skills. And like, you know, just this past weekend, we had our quarterly meeting. Um, it's like our, we, we used to do monthly, but now we're doing quarterly like kickoff meetings. And we reviewed all of the last year and then our plans for the coming year and plus break it down by month. Um, it was a four and a half hour meeting. Uh, we spent three and a half hours on personal development, mm. goal setting, showing them how to, you know, create a plan. Mm. Um, literally walking them through, yeah. you know, like visualization. What do you picture your life like, you know, in 12 months? What do you picture mm -hmm. your life like in 12 weeks? Let's do an assessment of what's going on right now. You know, three and a half hours of that. And it's because I've been blessed in so many ways by learning a lot of these techniques. Um, mm -hmm. you know, been like blessed by people that I've known and that have helped help me. And, uh, you know, I, I feel a sense of duty to be able to pass that on to these people in Mexico.
what's been impactful for them um, as far as what do you go over as far as goals and personal development or certain books that you recommend? And um, I want to recommend, um, and, and you could, you don't have to answer me now, but I had David Long on. David Long is a book and about culture and companies and he may be a great guest for your podcast. Um, oh yeah. So I'll, That's awesome. I'll send you his info, but everyone should check out. We did, you know, I did an episode with David Long who we talked about this and um, as well. But um, what kind of things did you, do you recommend? Um, um, you know, so th this, it's mainly a thing that I've learned from Russ Perry who started Design Pickle. Um, and they call it like the core four. Um, it, he didn't create it, somebody else created it. But it, it, it first it's in a, 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 they call it like a framework for building good habits. And that is the focus for us this year um, as a company because we know exactly what we need to do to make our clients happy, to keep them happy and to grow. And so it's just a matter of creating amazing daily habits and executing on those every single day. So, you know, we talked about creating good habits in four different areas of your life. So uh, the first one being your body. So your physical being, you know, this shell that houses us that we have to take care of because we only have one, yeah. um, you know, making sure that that is okay. Your mental state is, uh, is the second one and then your relationships with other people and then ultimately your business. And as entrepreneurs, we always tend to focus on the business side and say, okay, if I just make more money, then I'll be able to, you know, take my kids on a vacation and then Sales they'll like me. Cures all type of thing. Right. And then if I, and then if I um, do that, then I'll feel happier. And then I'll finally have, you know, have some money and some time to be able to invest in that personal trainer. The reality is it doesn't work like that. You have to start at the top at the body and then get everything else in alignment and then your business will fall into order. Mm. Um, and I, it's something that I've been doing personally for over a year and I've seen, you know, I can attribute, you know, a lot of my success over the past year to that specifically. So we taught them that in the meeting. Um, and real then it just quick, comes down for yeah. real quick, Chris on that. I want to pause on that for a second. What are your personal habits? as far as health goes, I know you like to stay fit. What, like, I don't know if there's certain things, yeah, you know, so, supplements you do, any routine you do as far as your health goes. No, man, I'm not really like a biohacker. To me, mm -hmm. I think that's kind of bullshit. I, it's very simple. Like it, it's not rocket science. You just got to exercise and you got to eat healthy mm -hmm. and you got to do it consistently. So part of this core four is every day you got to exercise seven days a week. Um, and then every day you do a green smoothie that includes veggies, not necessarily all the fruits because you know, fruits are good. Veggies are, are mm -hmm. probably what most people are lacking. So that's it, you know? So like personally, I go to the gym. Um, I also do, all right, well, I'm back to training jujitsu because I got hurt. I tore my meniscus. And so it took three months off for that. But go to the gym. I started doing yoga. It's been unbelievably helpful because the years of wear and tear are definitely wreaking havoc on my body. And so I need that for recovery. Um, so those are, those are the main things that I do. You know, mm -hmm. I'm actually doing my first Brazilian Jiu Jitsu tournament this weekend, so I'm pretty wow. excited. Wow, really? Yeah. Just a glutton for punishment. How do they hey, match you up with? I'm the Punisher. They, yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't see a way to escape that unless you knock someone out quickly. <laughs> um, but um, how do they match you up? Is what do you mean? Certain, the... Is it certain like? Um, yeah, so skill, I'm you know I'm still a beginner. Level. I'm still a, yeah. I'm still a white belt, and then I'm I just turned forty, so I'm in the. Um, uh, they call it the executive category at this tournament, but it's the masters three. Okay. So I go with guys who are in between 40 and 49. Um, and I'm in the white belt division and my, my weight class. So I'm going to be competing at the 207, 207 and a half. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't know, 195 to 207 and a half somewhere in there. So yeah, that's, I know you, down. you know, Chris, you have a lot of thoughts and experience as far as hiring culture. And I want you just to comment on, you always talk about talent in unpopular places. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, I'm a firm believer now. I wasn't always, yeah, I didn't always believe this, um, that your people are your most important asset of your company. Like your product can change. The market could be like, hey, we don't like this thing anymore, you know? Um, but if you have amazing people, I 100% believe that you guys will figure out another way to be successful. So when it comes to hiring talent, um, I think that a lot of people are trying to solve the same problem using the same people in the same areas. And, you know, I never thought about it this way, but you, you've probably read that book, Blue Ocean Strategy, yes. right? I think a lot of us are trying to find talent in a red ocean of people. 
And um, what, one of the things that we're doing in Tijuana is finding talent in a place that nobody ever thought you could find good people, right? And there's so many other pockets for talented, hardworking, you know, driven individuals that want to contribute and that want to be a part of your organization and will do whatever it takes to help you be successful. And so, you know, this kind of goes back to me always feeling like an under, underdog myself. You know, I've, I've never really felt like I was sitting at the cool kids table or that, you know, opportunities were, were not given to me uh, or didn't present themselves. That's just, this is just my personal belief, might be a limiting belief. But I just don't think that, it, you know, it, it just wasn't there the, the way that um, I've seen it for other people. Mm. And so, you know, I've always kind of felt like the underdog. Perfect example, you know, when I was a kid. <laughs> a lot of things go back to your childhood. You're a doctor, maybe you know this. Um, so when I was a kid and I played Little League and, uh, you know, I was a pretty good athlete when I was a kid and they're picking the teams for the All-Stars. I was always be on the All-Stars. But when I got to about 12 years old, <clears throat> the politics, and I think anybody who's ever played Little League Baseball can attest to this, <laughs> the, the politics ball. of Little League Baseball really started to factor in because now you were playing, you know, All-Stars. It was like a travel team, da 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 you can go to the World Series. And so, you know, my dad wasn't a part of this cool clique of, of kids, and that filtered down to me. Um, you know, even though I was athletically, you know, as talented, if not more talented, I, I was just kind of like pushed off to the side. Right. Um, and so I think that's probably where this kind of like underdog feeling kind of happened from. And then other like childhood shit too, but. What, so. um, you know, yeah. So you have the underdog mentality. And so you, you go in, how did you even discover? Yeah. I'm going to look at talent in Mexico going back to my dad. Yeah. So my dad always said that he wanted to be able to do something back in Mexico. So my mm -hmm. grandfather immigrated here from a little, it's not even a city, a little town in Mexico called Encarnacion. It's in the middle of Mexico. And he walked across the border in the early 1900s. He was 13 years old. He was born in 1896 or 1897. Wow. His birth certificate says, he has two birth certificates. They both say the same, different years. So he walks across the border um, eventually makes his way into Kansas um, and meets of my grandmother. Places. Yeah. Well, at that time, American factories were recruiting people from Mexico to come work in mm -hmm. the factories because mm -hmm. they didn't have enough labor. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so grandfather took the, you know, 13 years old, just like, all right, I'll go, you know. And so um, eventually meets my grandmother. They have kids. And so that, that's kind of like my Mexican heritage. So my, my, grandfather could speak English, could not read. My grandmother could not speak English, also could not read. Um, my dad was the youngest of eight, so he grew up in a very Mexican culture, wow. you know, in, in, his, in his household. And then uh, he always wanted to go back and do something in Mexico. So I had started a digital agency in 2012. Like many people, I went to the Philippines, had all my staff there. I moved from LA down to San Diego, and I'm like, I gotta find other people. You know, the time zone thing communication, staying up to one o'clock in the morning, like you mentioned earlier, was just killing me. So I'm like, okay, I got to find new talent. And I remember in the back of my head, my dad says, I want to do something in Mexico. I'm like, okay, well, let me see if I can find people in Mexico, some designers and developers. And I didn't know anybody. I didn't know the laws. I didn't know. I don't speak Spanish, right? And basically just took the leap of faith and ended up going down there and started a company figure that whole mess out, um, went through, you know, hired people, figured out the culture and hiring and like things are, there's a lot of little things that are very different that can make a, make your life not very pleasant if you don't know them, hmm. which I didn't. And so we figured that, but we figured it all out eventually. And then just, you know, grew my agency, I had over 220 clients on retainer, five people managing the whole thing. And it was great. That's and, amazing. Um, yeah. So that my my desire to go down to Mexico was just kind of like my dad talking to me in the back of my head. Where are there other unpopular places that come to mind? Either you use them or don't use them, as far as finding talent. Are you talking about in Mexico or in the it, U.S.? No, or? in U.S. Anywhere it could be online, U.S., Mexico. Well, here, here's the big shift that I hope that if there's anything that anybody gets from this um, interview, it's stop hiring for technical skills. Hire for soft skills. Hire the person. You need to look 
at their values. You need to look at what's inside because you can always teach somebody how to do things, right? There's certain, yes, there are certain skills. People are, you know, more uh, naturally gravitate towards certain areas, right? But it really just comes down to the person. You can have the most amazing developer on earth. If they're an asshole and they only care about themselves and they're never going to, you know, care about the clients and you, mm. when it's crunch time and you need them, they're like, peace out, it's five o'clock. That person is never going to help you succeed. So you, whatever it is, I don't care where they are on earth. You need to look at the person first. And I think that in our industry, people aren't doing that. And that's why they're having all these problems. You know, like everybody always complains about millennials and their entitlement, right? Stop hiring people who had that entitlement mentality, like entitlement uh, growing up, you know, like those people were raised by a certain demographic of parents that were all giving the participation trophy mm -hmm. and telling you that you're a special little snowflake, right? But not everybody had that same upbringing. Not everybody is being indoctrinated with those types of values. So just get out of that little pool of people and move into a different pool. It doesn't matter if they didn't go to Stanford. It doesn't matter if they even went to college. It didn't matter, you know, like if they had a bad economic background and they don't know how to use credit, right? That stuff doesn't matter. What, comes, what it comes down to is the person that's inside. And there are ways that you can get in there and you can figure out what's going on. And that's some of the things that I think that we've done really well in our hiring practices is being able to fire, find out who these amazing people are, hire the technical skills second, and then give them the opportunities to do the amazing stuff that we know that they're capable of. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, thank you. Um, I love that. Uh, how do you put into practice? What are some of the processes I know you're big on a specific hiring process and yeah, you have one thing you say is like you close the door behind you situation in the same room. So talk a little about your hiring process. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, this is something that anybody can replicate. Um, so I'm just going to talk about like uh, developers cause that's the most you know common thing that we hire for. So the first thing that we do, um, you know, the hiring process starts with the, the job post. So we put a job post out, we, in the job post specifically, we say, you know, send us your, resume in Mexico, they call it a CV, then it's your resume, right? And, and we're looking at how they do these things. Um, you do have some people that will apply and not attach a resume, which is shocking. Um, or you need these requirements, right? And so, you know, if they don't have those minimum requirements or they don't at least acknowledge those minimum requirements, then you just kick those people out. Um, you know, when we've hired people in the States, the, it's what, this is like the most, kind of shocking thing is that if you put in there like attach your resume as a PDF um, one page and in the title of the uh, of the subject in the email that you're going to send me make sure that you put the date and then you put the title that you're applying for 80% of people will fail that it's amazing so yeah so the interview starts with the uh, job post um, so then once they submit their resume you're going through it, you know, making sure that everything looks okay. And then we will send out a, um, an email, which is kind of like a survey. Tell me three websites that you've built. Um, you know, do you have these skills? What are you looking to do with your career? What interested you in the company? Kind of generic types of questions. We're looking at the answers, but we're also looking at how they respond. Mm. Right. So if they say something like, um, well, and this happened very recently. Um, we had a person who was applying for a leadership, uh, a team leader position. And they're like, I'm great at speaking English. I'm great at writing English. I just have, I'm very intimidated by speaking the, to other people in English. And I'm like, okay, well, that's kind of a deal breaker. So, you know, those <laughs> sorts of things. Or if they take forever to reply, you know, so if they send their CV, we reply to them, hey, here's your email. And then we don't hear from them for three weeks. It's not really somebody that we want to consider. That's just us, right? So after they do that, then we'll, and uh, everything looks good, we'll schedule a, a quick 15-minute phone interview. And that's really just to look at how they sound and, you know, are they rude? Are they nice? You know, are they personable? Just communication skills, really. Not many deep questions um, there. Um, after that, if they pass that test, then we'll go into a online um, uh, test to look at their HTML, CSS, PHP, JavaScript, all the technical skills that we need. 
Um, we use this service called Test Dome, T E S T D O M E. So we send them that test. It's timed. Um, you know, that's really just a standard that we use to evaluate all of our candidates. Uh, and so then we give them that. They have to finish it in a certain amount of time. If they do that and they pass it, then we'll bring them in for an in person interview. In that in person interview, we interview, we have them interview with at least four people. Um, usually it's the team leaders and everybody's interviewing on a different aspect. So some person's about the culture, some person about values, um, some person about technical, and then like I'll usually interview them and just ask some crazy questions. Um, and then after that, we all uh, we dismiss the candidate. We all get together, the people that interview them, we ask them, hey, you know, what did you think about this candidate? Did you have any red flags? What did you like? How did you think that they would fit in with our team? And it just becomes, you know, like a, a discussion. And, and, you know, at the end of that, all of us have to agree on two things that this is one, this is somebody that we would want on our team. And two, that this is somebody that we could see ourselves working for one day. Hmm. If any one person says no, we exclude that candidate. So, um, but if they pass, then we give them two more tests, one for a developer. We, we have to see them build out a website. And then the other thing that we do, which has also been a game changer is we do what's called a psychometric psychometric exam. And this looks at specific to the position, are there any red flags? You know, what's like kind of like aptitude type of thing, but more so about values and behaviors. Mm. Um, it's an online test. Um, Ray Dalio, I just learned Ray Dalio does uses this for his hiring process process. And so um, we use that and that gives us a better and even deeper snapshot as to how they would perform in the environment, um, in the work environment. So if they pass all of those, then we make that offer. And so a lot of people might be thinking that that's a very long drawn out process and I, I need somebody now and I can't do it. First of all, like never make the wrong hire. I've done it before. It's going to bite you in the butt. It's going to be way more painful. Don't make hires out of desperation. Um, but you know, the, the cool thing about this is that after the candidate has gone through all these steps, they're very, very invested in getting this job and you get somebody who's super excited to work for your company. And so you don't have to worry about this. You know, they're not going to leave because they've already spent hours and hours and hours trying to get this job and they've learned so much and they'll also respect you. They're going to be like, wow, man, everybody passed this test. Like we have some great people here. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, th those are the steps that we take to ensure that we have amazing people at our company. Do we get it right every time? Of course not. No system's perfect, but we get it right a lot more than we used to. So yeah, I, I mean, just highly the recommend front, just other the people front end. Yeah. You know, thanks for, <clears throat> for walking through this so detail because just the front end of it will eliminate 80%. And then you can imagine who ends up on the other side and actually completes this process. And then it gets approved by you and the team. So, yeah. So for developers, it's about the ratio is about one out of 40. Out of every 40 people that apply and get into the process, mm -hmm. we hire about one person. Um, Chris, the pricing and services, I want to get into that and how that's evolved. So talk about today as far as, because I know, you know, by doing research, the, the services have evolved a bit and the pricing has evolved a bit. Yes, So absolutely. presently, um, I know I mentioned unlimited, um, talk about how the services work and what people get for that. Yeah. So we have two packages. Um, and you know, I kind of gathered, I got the idea for, for dude by listening to a podcast of Russ Perry who started design pickle. And I was like, I can totally do this using development in my team in Mexico. And so we've emulated a lot of the things that they do. And, uh, Russ is actually, um, my coach now. So that's kind of nice to have nice. access to him. And so like our packages, um, we have two packages. We have the basic unlimited and we have the elite unlimited. Um, the basic unlimited has kind of remained the same for the past couple of years. Basically you get access to a team of six to eight people. You share that team um, with anywhere from 10 to 15 other agencies. Um, turnaround times are still really, really fast. You have a team leader who's your direct point of contact. You have daily communication with that person. You do weekly calls. Um, we're huge on open lines of communication because that's really where a lot of the challenges come mm -hmm. with uh, remote employees and outsourcing. How um, do you manage the clients in that, in that, uh, in different channels? Do you use Slack or how do you 
Make yeah, sure so we have our own ticketing portal. So mm -hmm. we developed this ticketing portal inside the portal. Basically, you know, if you need a mock-up done for a website, you list out. We list out all the things that we need to be able to get that done. Most of those things are exactly what you're already sending it over. But what's what's uh, what's kind of neat is that we've standardized it. So you know, every single time you're going to do this, 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 and this, and uh, you know, build out the same everything that we do. We've standardized that. So we have a ticketing portal. And then for a little daily communication, we do connect with our clients on Slack. Um, and then in the weekly calls, um, you know, that's really, really important. So, um, you know, in the weekly calls, we cover three main things. Basically, we, sit, we talk about any open projects. We talk about what's going well and what you want us to improve. And then finally, what's the goal for the week? So everybody's on the same page as to what we need to accomplish to make it a great week for you. Again, you provide a lot of support. Like when I, when I look through your website and I see, yeah, they do unlimited webs, websites, design, funnels, landing pages. It's, it's yep. way more than that because of the, the calls you provide and even training related materials. We invest a lot of time and resources at the beginning because if we do that, everything is going to flow so much more smoothly, you know, cause it's kind of like hiring a new employee. Right, that first couple months, they're learning your processes, how you guys communicate, all those things, your styles, you know. Um, so we kind of uh, are way more proactive on that, and we just schedule everything out so that we can learn from our clients as fast as humanly possible. And then, you know, after the two month uh, period, they can continue to do the weekly calls and the daily status updates. Um, but most of them will be like, ah, eh, just let me know when it's ready, yeah, or let me know if you have a problem because we've laid the foundation of building all that trust and really getting ingrained in that agency and how they operate. Hmm. So, so who's, who's, an ideal, my madness? who's an ideal client for that particular package? So uh, uh, an agency, digital marketing agency, specifically doing websites, specifically doing WordPress websites. Um, we typically work best, best with agencies that have been doing this for a little while, you know, because at the beginning you're just trying to get, clients, right? You're just trying to get, I say your, your, your niche is CC and P, anybody with a credit card and a pulse. And so, but eventually, you know, you figure this thing out and you figure out who your clients are and you really don't have any problems getting the clients. The problem comes with getting the work done and that's really where we come in. So, um, you know, typically clients, they're about, you know, at least two years in business. Um, and we, we typically work with uh, agencies that are in the 250, to uh, a million, million plus. We do have a couple agencies that are multi-million dollar agencies, but for the most part, our sweet spot is kind of like 250,000 a year in revenue up to about one, 1 1.2. Do you find, Chris, that agencies that come to you are doing the WordPress, they just want to offload the work or um, are there a more percentage of, they're doing maybe Facebook ads or something, something maybe not related to websites and they want to add a revenue stream on? Or Almost everybody is doing a marketing program. And that's why it's so important to have these systems and processes which we provide to help you get these websites done quickly. Because for a lot of agencies, the, web, the margins on the websites are not that great. You know, it's almost, it's some, well, I hope it's not a loss leader for everybody, but in many cases, it's a loss leader, right? Just to get these marketing programs going. And it's also the hook. So, uh, you know, XYZ doctor will come to you and be like, I really need to redo my website. And then the savvy digital agency owner will be like, okay, cool. Let's talk about that. What do you want the website to do for you? Oh, okay. And have you ever tried this? Da, 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 da. So they'll do a very thorough needs analysis. And the website is just one part of a program that they're selling to help solve this client's problems. Yeah. Um, but the website always, <laughs> it always needs to get done. And so, um, you know, they come to us and we do that. And then there's maintenance, right? So like if you're running a management or a, a marketing program, who's going to install the pixel? Who's going to build these landing pages? Who's going to create this unique graphic that you need for the ad, right? Those are all the other things that we're doing for the agency. So really anything that they would send over to a front end design and development team, that's what we do. Hmm. So, and then you said there's another package. The other package that we have, I, actually, I should take it back. We have three. The other package is the uh, Elite Unlimited, which is actually kind of a new package. That we, we tweaked it a little bit. Um, so with that one, instead of the shared team, you get a dedicated designer and developer. Um, they work for you full time. and You can communicate with them directly. And turnaround times are obviously super, super fast, real time. Um, so we have that package. And then we do have another program called our Dedicated Employee. So if you need somebody who's super specialized, 
and from a video direct or video editor to a full stack developer to whoever, this is like our staffing agency. We find that person in Mexico. We do our whole interview process. Once we find a good candidate, we send them to you. You go, you put them through your interview process hmm. and then uh, they're technically employed by our Mexican corporation, but they're dedicated to you for, you know, 40 hours a week. That's pretty cool. Yeah. It's great. Did you get man. a demand for that? How did that come about? Yes. <laughs> yeah. People started saying, Hey, I really need this person. Can you find that person for me? And I was like, Hmm, I think I can. Right. So we, that's, that's basically how it evolved. How is the, how is the service and pricing evolved? You know, I know from doing research, the pricing has evolved. I don't know within that. Pricing. Oh yeah. When we started out, yeah. we were charging four ninety seven, which was like, you know, that was like test the waters. We didn't have a lot of overhead. I just wanted to get clients and kind of prove the concept. And quickly it's grown to, you know, 997. And then I think it was 1297 and then 1497 and then 1997. And now it's 2497. Right. Um, you know, so I'm a big believer of the two that as your skills increase, your pricing yeah. should increase as well. Right. You know, our turnaround times are way faster. All these processes that we created for communication, the trainings that we've created for our clients, not just on operations, but also on sales. Like we have gotten so much better who wouldn't raise your price? Yeah. Like a guy, you know, if you're a baseball guy, which I'm not really, but if, if you're a guy who's batting, you know, 150, you're not going to double the rate of the guy that you're paying who's batting 300, right? It's yeah. exponentially better, better, uh, better performance. And so we basically just do the same thing. And really the thing that it comes down to is the ROI, right? We always want to help our clients get a five to 10 X ROI. So they've got to be, you know, selling. They've also got to be pricing appropriately. But if I can help you make another 2,500, 25,000 bucks a month, which is our target, like why wouldn't you invest 2,497 to get that team to help no you do brainer. that? Yeah, it's a no brainer. Yeah. Everybody I think I saw four, because I saw 497. I think he left off a two because when I see your page now, but it was just like some old post from, from the old days. Yeah, you know? those old days posts are out there. What um, <laughs> what do you tell clients from a client management perspective? Do you um, when you're raising your fees, <clears throat> do you grandfather well, all right, this them is, in? Do you, do you all of our exist, yeah, our, our old yeah, clients, you, our old clients get grandfathered in. Wow, so we definitely thank so it pays, our clients for that. It, yeah, it pays it, you know they thank you for you know they support you early on, but you thank them in the end because they're oh, getting yeah. a, a steal of a deal. Well, I, I'm on a Wistia program that you cannot get on Wistia. So anymore. am I. <laughs> yeah, I exactly. love it. So am I. I'm on that same program. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody does it in our industry. You know, you do want to reward your old clients. So, um, so yeah, this, thanks for shedding the light on that because it's really interesting. What, what pro type of projects or what do you tell people you don't do? What do you back end back end development? Yeah, um, you know, we certain platforms if we're not familiar with them and it's a one time thing. And, uh, you know, we just, you basically just do a call with your team leader and just say, Hey, can you guys handle this? And be like, are you going to do it like all the time? Or just like a one-off project? And I guess just this one time it's like, it's probably going to take us way too long just to learn this going up work and find somebody to do this one little thing. Um, yeah, but you know, mainly just backend development. Um, we don't do like Magento, uh, certain levels of Shopify, you know, if it's a custom theme, fully you know custom developed inside of liquid that's just not really our, our wheelhouse um, but the best part about us is that you have that relationship with your team leader so just ask you know yeah. yesterday that came across um one of our team leaders desks and what's really cool is because that shows that the client like trusts us and values our opinion so she's like hey i've got this project and they want to do this this and this and i'm like can you guys do it and uh, or she was like can you guys do it and I was just kind of like looking at the conversation because she CC'd me. And so, you know, that team leader will now talk to them and be like, okay, so like, what's the end goal and what's your budget and how, what's the turnaround time? You know, that's a big one. And they can basically just talk it out and she can determine what's the best course of action. What's been some of the most popular services that are requested? Yeah, I know you yeah, mentioned four, Webflow. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, four main things that we do. It's very, very clear. Um, building out WordPress websites. So doing the mock-ups and then doing the development. We don't always do the mock-ups, but mo the majority of agencies will have our design team mock it up, send it over to the development team. We build those out. Most of them are using a theme. Um, and usually it's like the same couple of themes. Uh, 
they can use whatever theme that they want. Um, yeah, but that's what, you know, the majority of what we do is that. And then second would be updates and changes to existing sites. So stuff breaks, stuff needs to be added, stuff needs to be taken off. Johnny got fired, whatever, you know, so we do all that stuff. Plugin updates, backing up the site, site speed optimization, all those little, those little things, we do that. So that's the second thing. Third thing is landing pages and funnels, whether that be in ClickFunnels, lead pages, or WordPress even. Um, we do those. And then the, the fourth thing is design work. So digital design. We do everything digital, banners, um, ad graphics, whatever. The only thing that we don't do are logos, big, big eBooks, and uh, print. Hey, Chris, someone's listening right now. They're not an agency, but they're like, I want to use Chris's services. Um, and maybe like, I need a ton of landing pages, click funnels, websites. What is, how do you handle those people? I get their information and then I figure out one of my clients who would be the best fit. Okay. Yeah. We're super deep into our lane. Like we stay in our lane and, um, I just know from running an agency that I don't have the time to be able to dedicate to these people to help them be successful. I'm a huge lover of the small business owner because I'm a small business owner. I know how hard it is and I wouldn't shortchange them by trying to take on a project just because they threw a bunch of money at me. Yeah. So you'd be like, Hey, I know you want this done. I have an agency that we work with and we help them with doing all this stuff. Here's, you know, talk to them and they'll kind of, you know, because the reason you do that, it seems like is it just streams on your process. You're working with people who know what they're doing. They know what to ask for. And if you're dealing with, kind of clients who aren't agencies, they may make requests or not, may not do it in a manner that is, is going to take more of your team's time. Is that? Yeah. It just comes down to the communication really, you know, so well, most agencies are great at strategy and they're great at selling and they struggle with the operations, right? We're like the opposite. Like we're amazing at the operations and my staff, I love to sell personally. I love to do the strategy, but I can't do everything my staff are not great at the sales and the strategy part. So we just, we love to implement. So let's just put everybody in the right seat. Right. You yeah. know, so, um, you know, that's why we stick to the operations. Yeah, I agree. That's kind of how we are with the podcasting too. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for you, I always end Chris, uh, first of all, thank you for your time and oh, uh, you. knowledge and sharing this is you learn from a podcast um, you know, with Russ's and now he, he's coaching you and it's helped your business. Um, I've had people listen to, and they may listen to you like who have become, you know, board members of that person's company or they become friends or clients or whatever it is. So I'm sure people get a lot out of this. I always ask two things. One, um, since inspired insider, what's been the, one of the lowest moments and how you push through. And then on the other side of things, what's been a really proud moment for you and um, what that looks like? Uh, two very, very good questions. Yes. Uh, lowest moment. Um, and it could be business related. Like I know we talked about a lot of tough childhood stuff and your, your dad, which is, you know, incomparable to like, you know, what in business, but you know, it could be just a big, big low moment or challenge. Well, this is the thing, you know, like I feel like I'm a pretty tough guy, right? And I can get through pretty much anything. And the reason that I've been able to develop this toughness is because of all of the challenges that I had when I was a kid and uh, well, and a young adult too, you know? So like going through those things shaped me and gave me the strength to persevere through a lot of the crap that we had to deal with, you know, growing a business. Any entrepreneur will tell you that there is always something, some, something's broken, something needs to be fixed, some challenge, um, unforeseen challenge. Um, so there's always something that we have to overcome. And so, you know, when it comes to some of my biggest or my, my one biggest obstacle, uh, I, I would have to go back to, you know, a couple of years after my dad died, I was broke, no money. Um, you know, I, I was just on the verge of getting a job and I just had a breakdown, you know, like I was just so angry inside and it was just a moment, something super stupid set me off. And I was just, I was just so furious that I was walking around the neighborhood, chain smoking, 
trying to get out, get rid of this anger. And I just couldn't see straight. I was so angry. I couldn't see straight. And, um, and then I realized, you know, like, I don't want to live like this. Like, I don't like this person that I am and I need to figure out a way uh, of how to deal with this. And so I reached out to a therapist and um, well, I made the decision at that time to reach out to a therapist. That was the big thing. It's just admitting to yourself, I need help. Because I think a lot of guys try and fix everything on their own because we're stupid and pig headed. And um, this is one area that I did not have a clue about and I needed help. So the first step was just admitting that I needed somebody to help me because I, I wasn't going to live like this. I don't think that I would live much. I wouldn't be able to live much longer had I not gotten some help. And so I made the decision that I was going to find a therapist. And back in the day, you know, I went on Google and I just started dialing, you know, because I didn't know who to look for. Just started dialing, you know. And then uh, the first person who called me back was this woman named Susan. She was based out of Manhattan Beach. She was an amazing, uh, she is an amazing human being. Um, I'm still in contact with her. We talk at least like once a year or message. And so, um, you know, I went to that appointment for therapy and uh, didn't know what to expect. It was an intro appointment, so you don't really get into much deep stuff. And at first, I didn't really like her. But then as I started Why? to think about it more, because she's a ball buster, man. Yeah. You know, like I can be fairly stubborn. And at that time, I was you definitely like that. Exactly. Like in the, the moment that I realized how much I needed her, we were talking about, I was talking about something. I was, you know, blaming everybody for my problems or whatever that, that whatever in that moment was bothering me. And she's listening, you know, being very, um, just, just listening, right? Which is rare. How many people don't have anybody to listen? So she's just listening. And then at the end, she's like, well, you know, how's that working out for you? I said, this mm. is the way that it is or something like that. And I can't change that. And she's like, how's that working out for you? And I was like, you fucking bitch. How dare you say that to me? <laughs> it's amazing how one sentence is. Yeah. yeah. I'll never forget it. And then I walked away from that. And I was like, she is 100% right. You know, like, I'm doing it so wrong. Yeah. It's funny, you know, Chris, you know, that's what my wife does. She's a child psychologist. Oh, wow. And so she works with kids who are going through divorce, separation, you know, uh, death, illness, anxiety, depression. So I've gone um, through all those. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, she never shares names or identities, but I hear smitterings of that stuff. And it's, it's like the, it's so, it's, it's life changing to have someone to She saved my listen. life, man. She and, saved my life. My yeah. therapist saved my life. I wouldn't be here yeah. if it wasn't for Susan. Yeah. So I'm glad you decided to, you know, most people, I think a lot of people, maybe not most people don't have the courage to actually just, you know, admit they need help and get it, you know, to, to varying degrees. Like we all yeah. have different degrees of that. So, well, the, you know, the, the reality that I was facing at that time is like, I get help or I die. What's it? That's what, those are your choices right now. What do you want to do? Yeah. And I don't think my dad would be very proud of me if I killed myself. So. No. Um, thanks for sharing that. It's really, you know, um, really touching and uh, is, it takes a lot of courage to share this stuff, you know, so other people can learn from it. Um, and what about on the flip side? Yeah. The, Proud, the proudest moment. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Um, proudest moments, probably also not necessarily business related. There's so many little things that we're doing at our company every day, you know, we're celebrating some some win but i think probably one of the proudest things that i've ever done on the personal side too is um you know i was a mentor to a kid named patrick um his mom died of cancer in 2012 mm -hmm. december 8th 2012 and patrick was 13 at the time and um basically you know like i was just there for him and he graduated How did you high know school. him through a charity there's a charity in los angeles called walk with sally and um, the founder, Nick, he had lost his mom to cancer when he was 13. And he's like, I wish I just had somebody. So I heard about this charity. I was like, I got to do this, right? My dad had been dead for five years. I was like, I got to do this. Get matched up with Patrick. You know, it was like instantly we became buddies. And uh, then his mom died. And then I was like, you know, I got I to gotta help this kid. I got to be there for him. It wasn't always easy. 
you know, he went through some really, really dark times as well, but he graduated high school. And then, um, you know, in next month in February, I don't know when this podcast is going to air, but uh, end of February, he turns 21. I just turned 40 and we've been talking about celebrating our, his 21st and my 40th together since he was 13 years old. Hmm. So, you know, we're finally going to be able to do that. That's awesome. So, yeah. And then he's a great guy. Great, <clears throat> great human being. Uh, I'm inspired by him constantly. What about from the team? I know you're probably a lot, uh, very proud about as far as the culture and hiring and the team. Is there something you can talk about as far as a celebration you did with the team or a milestone of the team as far as culture goes? Oh man. Um, it's hard to say cause there's so many little things that they do that always like, what do you do to celebrate proud of. like with the team? Um, and it could be maybe on a monthly or quarterly or yearly basis. What, what things, you know, you always hear that some companies they'll ring a bell if something happens or what, I don't know if there's a internal celebration or Slack channel or something you do to celebrate certain wins internally. Um, it's usually revolves around food. Okay. <laughs> so we do like a lunch, um, cakes, like they always go out for beers. The, the culture is a way different here in Mexico. So like going out for beers with your boss is like unheard of, but I love it when they get together, when they go have fun together, mm -hmm. you know, cause they're so tight. It's rare, you know, that you have any organization of 30 plus people and everybody gets along that there's not clicks, right? Everybody in our office gets along. And while I might not always be invited to go to the celebrations, it does make me really happy when it's Friday and you know, all the, the, the ladies are getting ready to go out and the guys are like, you know, planning the bar that they're going to all go to and they all go together. Yeah. Like to me, kind of like you built like a family. Exactly. Right? And I've said that, you know, in, in our meetings in the past, I was like, we are the band of misfit toys. Like we are, if you've always felt like you're an outsider, that things don't have to be the way that everybody else in society tells you it has to be. If you're looking for that place to call home, like this is it, this is your family. And we've created that. Chris, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone should check out dudeagency.io. Anywhere else we should point people towards online. Uh, dude agency. I mean, our Facebook page and our Instagram page always have fun videos too. So, you know, we have a full-time video marketing team. So they're always coming up with some cool stuff. Like for example, one of my favorite videos we ever did was uh, real Mexicans eat fake tacos. So they eat Taco Bell for the fa first time. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really fun one. Okay, we'll have to check that out. Link up that, that video somewhere. Um, oh yeah, for sure. Everyone check out dudeagency.io. Thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.